Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number 21, and we're going to look at loss of kidney function. So our little Cook's tour of random organs has taken us from the ear to the eye, and is now going to take us to the kidney. So we're going to look at some of the structures that are present and how they function in the kidney, and also some of the potential problems associated with loss of kidney function. So as per usual, we want you to be able to describe the main structures in the kidney and how blood is filtered. And we're specifically going to look at the nephron as the unit of um, kidney function, and then to discuss one or two of the potential causes of lost or reduced kidney function. So firstly, a general look at the kidney. You've got two of them. They regulate osmotic pressure in the blood through an extensive filtration and purification process which is known as osmoregulation. This involves both water and salts, and it means that the body is able to regulate through the homeostatic mechanisms that we talked at right at the beginning of this unit, the levels of water and salt, and therefore to retain water if the, the body's low in water, or to release excess water if there's, um, if there's plenty around. This can also happen for salts, and there is some um, processes of both active and passive um, reabsorption of both water and salts through these very important um, filtering units in the kidneys. We know that their primary function, when we think about kidneys, we think of them as filters, and they do filter the blood. The urine that is um, produced as a result, often it's really just what's left over once we've taken all of the other things that we want out, is what is eliminated um, through the ureter um, uh, into the bladder and then out through the urethra. As I mentioned, the most important unit that we need to talk about in the kidney is the nephron, and we will look at that in a little bit of uh, additional detail. Um, and that's because there's over a million nephrons in each of your kidneys, and each of those nephrons is associated with a network of blood vessels and capillaries. Now, it's, it's general practice that when you um, look at this particular section of work, you will dissect a kidney. That's not too difficult a dissection. You cut it in half basically, that's it. And you'll see three important regions. You'll see the pelvis, which is this region in the center. Uh, then you'll see the uh, cortex and the medulla. And the medulla is the middle region um, here. And then the cortex is the region on the outside. You'll see this some slightly different because of the um, difference in color. So that'll be the main indication to you. And that has a lot to do with whether we're talking about tubules, the, the little tubes that are pretty much stretch into the medulla and do have blood vessels around them. But the higher concentration of those blood vessels does tend to be in the cortex, which is why that, that color is a little bit richer. Uh, when you're looking at the sections uh, through the kidney. So what are these nephrons and what do they do? Oxygenated blood, which has come from the heart, so it's been through the lungs, it's coming back from the heart, it's going down into the kidneys. We've got nice oxygenated, oxygen-rich blood, and that goes into the kidney through the renal artery, away from the heart and into the renal uh, region, which is where the kidneys are. And um, it, as it splits into smaller and smaller um, blood vessels, it will eventually become a little ball of capillaries, and that little ball of capillaries is called a glomerulus. Um, and at the glomerulus, what we have is we have a whole lot of very concentrated capillaries close together, and high blood pressure is going to squeeze a whole lot of material out of the blood. Basically, anything that's small enough to fit th through those spaces is going to be filtered out of the blood at this point in time. So big things like blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, they're not going to go through the membrane into the Bowman's capsule, but everything else pretty much um, is going to. So lots of small molecules. Um, water obviously is going to do that. So think about the plasma and a lot of the stuff that's in the plasma. We can't get rid of it all because it would end up with, uh, we wouldn't be able to have the blood continuing to flow out of the glomerulus, but a huge volume of um, that blood is filtered, basically transferred from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. And the Bowman's capsule is just like a little funnel that is catching that um, fluid that's coming through from the glomerulus. So some things are going to remain in the blood. They're going to continue through the system, but other things are going to be transferred from the blood into the Bowman's capsule. Now, the problem is that we get everything that's little, basically, that passes through the membrane, which means that 
after that filtrate has come through into the Bowman's capsule, we then need to have a way of being able to um, sort it and recover uh, water, salts, glucose, any other materials that we think that are going to be important for the body. And there's a long series of convoluted or, or folded tubes that are part of these nephrons that are surrounded by capillaries after the um, glomerulus, basically, the blood, is, uh, the blood vessels will wind around these different tubules and they'll be recovering some of these important compounds. And so we find after the Bowman's capsule, we have what are called the proximal. So proximity, if you're in my proximity, we're near each other. So proximal convoluted, so they're not a straight tube. So a tube that's little is called a tubule. They kind of wind and bend, and that's why we call them convoluted, um, because they're quite complex, um, not just straight tubes. Um, and so some of them are very near the Bowman's capsule, so they're the proximal ones. Then we have a structure called the loop of Henle. And then we have a distal, like in the distance, convoluted tubule, so another windy, bendy tube, but it's further away now. And then that leads into a collecting tube. That comes into the pelvis, the pelvic region of the kidney, and then will um, go through the ureter into the bladder to be stored for, for later expulsion. So one of the important things that we have to remember about the um, whole function of the kidney is that it doesn't just filter stuff out of the blood, it actually reabsorbs materials from these tubules back into the blood. So we've got stuff coming out and we've got stuff going back in. And these two processes of filtration and reabsorption are part of what is necessary for this regulation of um, homeostasis, particularly in relation, as I said before, to water and salts. The way that the water and the salts can be reabsorbed can either be through passive diffusion, so just creation of a diffusion gradient, a concentration gradient, where material naturally moves from high concentration to low concentration, provided it's able to move through a semi-permeable membrane, or sometimes we have to actively transport it. We have to provide energy to pump it the wrong way, if you like. So if we've got a concentration gradient, which is naturally going to go high to low, like coming downhill. If we want it to go the other way, we've got to push it up the hill. That requires energy. And so that's an active transport process. The process is so effective that only 1% or around about 1% of the material which enters the Bowman's capsule from the glomerulus actually leaves the body as urine. So you can see a lot of this stuff that goes out, but it's reabsorbed. Um, a large amount of it's reabsorbed. One of the things that's reabsorbed is glucose, so sugars are important. The amount of water that's reabsorbed is going to depend on uh, a very important, the levels of a very important hormone um, called ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. And that is secreted in the brain in response to uh, measuring of those levels of water through the blood. So we know that homeostasis is critically important uh, process. It's where we started with this module. And so water regulation is important. There's another hormone called aldosterone, uh, and it's uh, related to salts. So if I put ADH is related to water levels, and then I can put aldosterone, and that's related to uh, managing the salt levels uh, in the body. And so again, whether we're actively reabsorbing ions like sodium and potassium, those sorts of things. Once we've um, re reabsorbed all of the material that we want from these tubules, the rest of it will just pass through into the collecting tubes. They um, emerge through the pelvis into the ureter, which runs to the bladder and from the bladder um, out the, of the body through the urethra. So that's the process basically by which um, the body filters blood, helps regulate levels of things like water and salts. Let's have a quick look at the nephron and make sure as we've done with the eye and the ear that you can track what's going on as you, as you follow this process through. So we've got blood that's coming into the, um, this structure network of capillaries in here. So this is our glomerulus. The outside structures here are the Bowman's capsule, and you can see that the Bowman's capsule is continuous with these um, convoluted tubules. Here's the loop of Henle down here, and then we're back up to our distal convoluted tubules and then into our collecting tube. So you can see that the passage is going to be through here, 
through here, through here, back up here, through here, and down to here. So this is how our fill trade is progressing. Also identify some of those important materials that are moving in and out as a consequence of um, different types of chemicals that are present. And also the important nature of um, reabsorption associated with water and also salts that we see happening at different regions um, within the nephron. But things can go wrong. And if you lose kidney function, then you lose your ability to filter waste from the blood efficiently, and perhaps also some level of uh, that osmoregulation that we were talking about before. There's five kind of areas that we can look at in terms of kidney function. They, they fit into the acute uh, or chronic, so short-term, long-term, usually when we're talking about acute and chronic, acute, really serious ones that have uh, very uh, significant short-term implications, uh, chronic are ones that seem to just occur over long periods of time. Sometimes they're not as severe, but they can be, um, but they tend to occur over long periods of time. So two types of uh, acute kidney failure are pre-renal and intrinsic. So pre-renal is basically um, before it gets to the kidneys, we don't have enough blood flow, and therefore uh, if the blood flow coming into the kidneys isn't great, we're not going to be able to effectively filter some of those toxins out of the blood. If you, if you get hit in the kidneys, if you have an accident, an impact, if you're in a car accident or something like that, um, maybe there's been a, a lot of toxins in your body or a lack of oxygen, this can also cause a lack of kidney function. So a failure of the kidneys to function properly. They're two kind of short-term, quick impact problems associated with the kidney. So these are our, these are our um, uh, serious short-term issues. Uh, we do have some others, of course. So um, that fact that we've talked about, not enough blood flowing to the kidneys, um, if that happens over long periods of time, then kidneys can actually start to shrink. We can see um, that they will, over time, uh, lose some of their function, and that may be difficult to reverse. Uh, and so, therefore, that may uh, extend that period of, of lack of kidney function on for a long period of time. The same thing can happen if we have these intrinsic problems. Again, something that may have happened is a direct trauma, um, some severe bleeding, internal bleeding, lack of oxygen to the kidneys may actually have reduced their function to the point where we can't get them back to what they were before. And sometimes urinary tract prevention um, uh, urinary tract infections or blockages, uh, like kidney stones, for example, can prevent urination, and that can build pressure back up, which can uh, also cause kidney damage and maybe reduced kidney function. So there are a number of different ways in which uh, kidneys can um, not function as they would. Nephritis is, the, is one of the common um, terms associated with um, diseases of the kidneys, um, and that, that linked to nephron or renal uh, are things that are certainly going to hopefully trigger your mind in your mind um, that this has something to do with kidney function. What we will need to do, of course, is to look at some of the ways that we try and address some of these problems associated with kidney function, but we'll do that in a subsequent video. Thanks for watching.